the most real things about life are the place you don't know and the place you know. And you could say, well, that's explored territory and unexplored territory. That's real and it's been around forever. Back to the lobsters. You know, if you put lobsters in a new place, the first thing they do is go around their territory, finding places to hide, and also making a burrow. So the first thing they do is establish what they know against what they don't know. And that's real. It's real from the Darwinian perspective. And we're going to say that what's real from the Darwinian perspective is plenty real enough. Because we're alive and everything, and so that sort of thing matters. It's like, well, that's what this is, the Taoist symbol. That's what it says. Is the, what's, what it says, what is experience made of eternally? That's easy. Chaos and order. And in every bit of chaos, there's the possibility of order. And in every bit of order, there's the possibility of chaos. And that's the way, right? That's the path of life. That's life itself. And where you're supposed to be is right on the border between the two of those. And why is that? Stable enough? Engaged enough? Right? So, not only are you doing what you should be doing, you're doing it in a way that increases the probability that you'll do it better tomorrow. And you can tell when you're doing that because you're engaged. You're in the right time and place. And your, your, your neurology tells you that. That's what meaning is. That's what transcendent meaning is. And that's so cool because I also think that that is the antidote to existential suffering. The antidote to existential suffering is to be at the right place at the right time. And you know, you want to get technical about it. Okay, anxiety and pain. That, that, that's, the, that's the reality of existential suffering. Okay, so let's say you're in the right place at the right time. What happens to you biochemically? Dopaminergic activation. What does that do? Suppresses anxiety, and it's analgesic. Now, it's more than that, because it also produces positive emotion and the desire to move forward, and it underlies creativity. And, and so, so, not only do you get the positive engagement from a neurochemical perspective, you get the analgesia, and you get the, anti, and, and you get the reduction of anxiety. So, it's not hypothetical. It's, and, and it is the case that the dopaminergic systems, those are the exploratory systems, unbelievably ancient and archaic, are activated when you're optimally positioned to be, to be um, what, incorporating new information, which is what human beings do, because we're information foragers. And so we want to be secure, but building on our security at the same time. And then we want to do it for ourselves, we want to do it for other people, we want to do it for our families, we want to do it for broader society. We want to bring the whole world together in alignment to do that, and that's meaningful. And God only knows what we could do about the suffering of the world if we did that. You know, we have no idea what we could do if we started doing things properly. And maybe so many of the things that dismay us about life, we could, we could stop. I mean, we stopped a lot of them in the last hundred years. You know, things are a lot better than they were a hundred years ago. Obviously, they're not perfect. But a hundred years ago, 120 years ago, man, you know, the average person in the Western world lived on less than a dollar a day in today's dollars. It's like, you just try that for a week and see how much fun that is. So, the Taoists... Well, what is this? Well, this is the pre-cosmogonic chaos out of which the Word of God extracted habitable order at the beginning of time. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And that chaos, we'll talk a bit more about that later, I guess, because it's a very complicated thing to, to describe. But it's certainly the thing that when you encounter... The chaos is what you encounter when the Twin Towers fall. Right? You remember what that was like, right? So, it was, it was September 10th. Well, that was the world. Everyone knew what the world was like. And then it was September 11th, and everyone walked around dazed for three days because the buildings fell. But so what? You can see a building fall. You can understand what, it's, what happens when a building falls. So then what's going on with the being dazed? Well, it's the chaos that underlies our habitable order manifested itself when those buildings collapsed. It was a brilliant act of terrorism. And everyone was frozen and curious because that's how we react to that sort of thing. The, the, it's, like, it's like the shark. You know, remember that famous, that famous movie poster for Jaws with the woman swimming on the top of the water and that terrible leviathan shark underneath coming up to, to take her out. Well, that's life, man. That's the world. And now and then you see that. And when something falls like the Twin Towers fall, you, you remember that the ocean below you, the abyss, right? The primordial abyss, that bloody thing is deep. And, and you're fragile. And that happens when someone betrays you, and it's happen it happens to you when your dreams fall apart. You encounter that chaos again, from which the world is extracted, and then you're called upon to act out 
attention and the word in order to bring the world back into order. And none of that is, none of that is superstitious. None of that is superstitious. None of that's even metaphorical. It's real. It's, it's more real than anything else. And I think the reason for that in part is that this has been, it's been this way forever. Right? As long as there's been life. This has been the rule of life. And that's the cosmos. That's reality. That's what we inhabit. And so, one of the things, you know, the, the, the so-called new atheists, and I, I don't want to go on a tangent about new atheists, because I think atheists are often remarkably honest and very consistent in their analysis. So, but I just don't think they're taking the problem seriously, man. Like, I don't think they take their evolutionary theorizing nearly with the seriousness that it, that it necessitates. And I don't think that... I don't think that you can dispute the proposition that the longer something has had a selection effect on life, the more real it is. It's the fundamental axiom of Darwinian biology. And I think the Darwinian world is more real than the physical world. That was the argument that I was trying to have with, with, with Sam Harris. And I didn't do the world's best job of that, although it went not too bad the second time. But it's, it's not something to be taken lightly. It's a very serious, profound, and meaningful proposition. And people act it out and want to act it out whether they know it or not. That's Marduk. So the, the story of Marduk, I'll just give it to you very briefly. Tiamat and Apsu are locked in embrace at the beginning of time. Goddess of salt water, god of fresh water, together. Chaos and order, right? They give rise, masculine and feminine, they give rise to the world of the elder gods. And those are, to me, they're primordial motivational forces, they're something like that. And their rage and their lust and their love and all these things that possess us that are there forever. And they're out in the world acting. And they carelessly slay Apsu, their father. And they're making a racket and then they kill Apsu. And then Tiamat gets wind of that. And that's Tiamat right there, by the way. She's kind of a rough looking creature. And she's the mother of all things. And so she's not very happy about this. They, these, her children have destroyed structure itself. Plus, they're noisy and careless, and so she thinks, all right, just like Noah, just like the God that brings the flood to Noah, exactly the same idea. Tiamat comes back and says, yeah, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to take you out. And she makes this battalion of monsters and puts the worst monster there is at the head of the battalion. His name is Kingu. He's like a precursor to the idea of Satan. And she lets the gods know, hey, I'm coming for you. And so they're not very happy about this because they're gods, but like, yeah, she's chaos itself, right? She gave birth to everything. This is no joke. And so they send one god out after another to confront her, and they all come back with their tails between their legs. There's no hope. And then one day there's a new god that emerges, and that's Marduk. And the gods know as soon as he pops up, they know he's something new. Remember, and this is happening while the Mesopotamians are assembling themselves into one of the world's first great civilizations. So all the gods of all those tribes are coming together to organize themselves into a hierarchy to figure out what proposition rules everything. And so Marduk is elected by all the gods and he says, look, I'll go out there and I'll take on Tiamat, but here's the rule. From here on, you follow me. I determine destiny. I'm the top god. I'm the thing at the top of the hierarchy. And all the other gods say, hey, look, no problem. You get rid of chaos, we do exactly what you say. Now, Marduk, he has eyes all the way around his head, and he speaks magic words. Those are his primary attributes. And so he takes a net, and he goes out to con confront Tiamat. And, and he, 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 he encloses her in a net, which I think is so cool, because it's an encapsulation, right? It's a conceptual encapsulation. He encloses chaos itself in a conceptual structure. He puts it in a net, and then he cuts her into pieces, and he makes the world. And then... Then he creates human beings to inhabit that world and to serve the gods. And he creates human beings out of the blood of Kingu, the worst of the demons. And that took me to Colin DeYoung, who was a student of mine, helped me figure that out. I thought, geez, that's pretty damn pessimistic. It's like, you know, what exactly? It's like a fall metaphor. It's like the idea of original sin. But, but our joint conclusion with regards to that was that 
Human beings are the only creatures in creation that can truly deceive. Right? We have the capacity for evil, just like it says in the Adam and Eve story. We can actually do that, and that's why we're made out of the blood of King Hu, the king of the demons. The, we are the thing that can deceive, that can twist the structure of reality. Well, so Marduk. Now, the, the Mesopotamians had an emperor, right? And the emperor was the avatar of Marduk. That, that's what made him emperor. He was only an emperor if he was going to be Marduk. He had to be a good Marduk, which meant he had to confront Tiamat, chaos, and cut her up and make order out of her pieces. And what the Mesopotamians used to do at the New Year's celebration, they'd go outside their walled city, and that's explored territory versus unexplored territory. They'd go outside their walled city into chaos, and they'd bring all the statues that represented the gods, and they'd act this out. Because they were trying to figure something out, right? They're trying to figure out what this means. They're acting it out. And then they'd take their emperor, and the priest would make him kneel, and, and they'd take all his king all his king uniform off, his emperor uniform off, and make him kneel and humiliate him and nail him with a glove and say, okay, how were you not a good Marduk this year, right? And then he'd recount all the ways that he was inadequate in confronting chaos, and then they'd do the celebration and Marduk would win and, and the king would go sleep with a royal prostitute. And, and uh, the reason for that was, it's the same idea as St. George pulling the virgin from the dragon. It's exactly the same idea, that if you, if you encounter the reptilian chaos, you can extract something out of it with which, if you unite, you produce creative order. That's what they were acting out. And, and that was the basis for the Mesopotamian idea of sovereignty. It's so smart. It's so unbelievably smart. And, you know, the Mesopotamians had a massive influence on the civilizations that then had a massive influence on us. It's one of the stories of how the notion of sovereignty itself came to be. It's the evolution of the idea of God. That's one way of thinking about it, but even more importantly, it's the evolution of the idea of the redemptive human being, right? And that's taken to its, one of its conclusions, well, in the story of Buddha, but also in the story of Christ, the idea of the perfect individual. And the notion is, well, that's the word that speaks truth into chaos at the beginning of time to generate habitable order that is good. That's the story.